again, everybody, and welcome inside the District of Sports podcast, our sports podcast here at the Washington Times. I'm George Gerbo. A reminder that you can find the District of Sports in a variety of ways. Just search District of Sports on all your favorite podcast platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. And a reminder to follow the excellent coverage of our sports reporters at WashingtonTimes.com slash sports. And we're joined once again by those reporters back with us, Matt Paris and Andy Koska. Guys, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah. I look forward to this as always. Excellent. Excellent. We are going we're going to start with the the Washington Nationals and we'll start on a little bit more of a serious note than we normally would uh, based on what happened in Saturday night's game on July 17th against the San Diego Padres at Nationals Park in the middle of the sixth inning uh, of the Nationals game. Three people were were shot and wounded outside of Nationals Park on South Capitol Street in what Metropolitan Police, Washington, D.C. police say was a shooting exchange of gunfire between two cars, three people wounded, uh, all of them non-life threatening. One of the people wounded was uh, a person who was at the game uh, and was leaving the game outside of the ballpark. Police and the Nationals confirmed no connection to to anything that, uh, no, no, not targeting the game, not connected to the game in, in any way, shape, or form uh, to give a little bit of peace of mind to fans. And the game eventually was completed on Sunday and the Padres ended up winning that game. But just, uh, I personally was at the game and just really, uh, unfortunately, I've been used to a couple of different events uh, here in Washington being um, the place that it is and specifically working on Capitol Hill for a few years in just kind of like being aware of things that may be out of the ordinary. And in in the middle of the, you know, the Padres walk off the field and the Nationals are about to come to bat in the sixth. And you just kind of hear this loud metallic banging sound, bang, 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 like four or five times. And, you know, initially thought, you know, did something collapse or did something fall? But then everybody as I and I was on the third base side of the of the stadium in section 110 and just kind of like looked back up the section. You could tell there was a little bit of a, a tremor, you know, in the crowd and people were looking. And especially if you were on that concourse to try to give people some uh, some color to it. Uh, the right field concourse at Nationals Park, if you're out there uh, in right field or the outfield, that's all walled in. There's nothing really open to the outside of the stadium unless you are standing by uh, near the home plate gate or near that area. But on the left side of the stadium, on the third base side of the stadium, there are concession stands. There's a con- very specifically, there's a concession stand in the bathroom. And then there's like a fence. So like it's open air to the outside to South Capitol Street. And I think that's why people on that side of the stadium could hear the the shots so loud. And so you had a lot of, uh, you know, just kind of people panicked and then people started hunching down and everything. And fortunately, thanks to the very quick work of the police department and the nationals uh, and Jerome, the public address announcer, you know, getting the information out there, it's outside incidents outside the stadium. They repeated that. And then about 10 minutes later, they instructed folks to, to go ahead and exit the stadium through the center field and right field gates. So Really confusing initially, but I, I credit the Nationals and I credit um, the people who work uh, in the public safety for the district and for MPD to kind of calm the situation uh, as it was going on. But th- more specifically, Andy, related to the players, it was funny because when I first looked up and saw the chaos on the concourse, you know, I'm like, oh, OK. And then like looked back at the field and the field was like a ghost town, like the players got out of there very quickly, you know, went into their dugouts. We saw. Uh, on the third base side where the visitors dugout is Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis Jr. were leading some of their family members who were in the seats there behind the dugout, as well as some other fans just kind of down into the dugout just for protection. Cause you really don't know what's going on in that time. Uh, and read reports uh, in multiple places, including from the Associated Press that Nationals manager Davey Martinez had some fans that were in his office or near his office in the concourse um, that came in presumably from the, the club level seats that are right behind uh, home plate there. And it, it's kind of a good way, you know, Davey has talked about since this World Series uh, win in 2019, Andy, that the Nationals are celebrating this year because it's the first time they've had fans in the park after not having them last year. And has always talked about how this is a, this this organization is a family and they really put their work behind those words in, in what happened on Saturday night. They did. Yeah. And I think, you know, just with we'll start off with with the Padres players. I think it was initially kind of like in between innings when it was an inning change when um, the, the shooting first happened. And so players were kind of already on their way off the field. But, you know, very quickly, you mentioned Tatis and Machado. And I think Will Myers, one of their mm-hmm. another Padres player, was was involved in this. They 
you know, got, got fans onto the field. Some of them were, were uh, their families, got them down in the, into the dugout into safety because, yeah, it was incredibly confusing. People didn't really know exactly where it was. Was it inside the stadium? Was it outside the stadium? Or was it even gunshots at all? You know, it was kind of just a confusing situation. Um, and then for, for Dave Martinez, so he often talks about, you know, you know how uh, you know how much he values the fans, and and he he, he backed it up in a big way when uh, when fans got down into um, into the clubhouse area near Martinez's office, and uh, you know he ended up checking on everyone. Um, you know, security guard asked them if if, if those fans were, were family members of anyone, and and how Martinez responded was, "Yes, they are family. They are fans." Um, so, you know, yeah, they, they had to move a little bit outside after they realized they weren't actually family members. They had to move a little bit outside the, the dugout or the, the clubhouse area, but they were still, you know, in, in protection and uh, in a safe spot. So they definitely, yeah, Martinez went a long way in um, kind of showing exactly who the, the kind of guy he is, the kind of, kind of guy he's shown he's been for you know quite a long time. Um, but it, it was just it was a scene where um, a lot of confusion, but a lot of quick thinking uh, from players and, and the manager as well. Yeah. And, you know, just unfortunately that, uh, that neighborhood in that area, uh, is not a stranger to it. The nationals, uh, have a commemoration, uh, out there in, in center field when you come in the stadium, um, for the 13 people that were killed in a shooting at Navy yard, you know, in an office building over at Navy yard, um, a few years ago. So it's, uh, they've proven themselves time and time again, even though they are the newest quote unquote of uh, our major sports teams here in the district, proven themselves time and time again to be a friend and an ally, uh, to the district and to this community here. Uh, and they back it up in, in words, uh, and actions as we saw on Saturday. So as, you know, as, as people who cover the team and as people who attend these games, you know, my, my hat off to the nationals and to all the public, uh, response first responders that, uh, helped and calmed the scene and, and made it far less chaotic than it could have been. So a shout out to them for the, the play on the field for the nationals, that game Sunday ends up wrapping up as, as a 10, four win for the Padres. And of course the Padres are a high flying team, Andy, uh, Washington has kind of hit this little, after we talked about so much, how they dug themselves out of the hole, it's kind of going to be this roller coaster Jekyll and Hyde season, uh, maybe in some ways, as now we're nearly through the month of July with a third of the month to go here. And they've only won four times in this month after going gangbusters in June. That has helped. They're six games back of first place, which is still the Mets who are playing some just, I'm going to call it stupid baseball. They've played <laughs> se- the last seven games. The Pirates are one of the worst teams in baseball, and the Mets have managed to throw some more of these games away when they should be racking these games up. That includes staking out a 6 nothing lead in a game this past Saturday against Pittsburgh, holding that lead into the eighth inning, and then ended up ending up losing it on a walk-off grand slam by Jacob Stallings. Uh, uh, just a ridiculous set of circumstances. And then, and then the following day on Sunday, the Pirates led 6 nothing, and the Mets came back from that deficit. So they've been playing... That and, and also fielding errors, which you've probably seen on on social media and YouTube. So they've been playing just some, you know, sloppy baseball as of the last week and a half. That's allowed Philadelphia to also assert themselves uh, in into this division race. The Phillies have gone 10 and four so far this month. And for Washington, it, it's going to be a couple of things. And it just kind of goes goes back to these anchors. Of course, we're still waiting for Kyle Schwarber and Steven Strasburg to to come back healthy. But you've got a great perspective uh, in your story about Juan Soto, who recently participated in the Home Run Derby during the All-Star break at Coors Field in Denver. 46 home runs Soto hit in that derby. And you you do a good job of contrasting these guys in recent years where, oh, you know, are you going to you're going to mess up your swing? Are you going to overswing? You're going to throw out your back or you're not going to be the same player. And for Soto, it appears he actually was able to use the derby as a positive and and provide a benefit to him in, in locating pitches better for helping to translate that into the rest of the season. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, he went into it with, he entered the all-star break with uh, 55% of his batted balls were, were ground balls, which is the most of his career and just a, a pretty, you know, large amount just overall. Um, and, and since that, you know, he kind of went into the home run derby thinking, you know, he didn't want to have some like, you know, crazy swing change or anything like that, but he wanted to focus on, on hitting fly balls, obviously just for the objective of the home run derby, but even beyond that, um, just to kind of figure out his swing and kind of translate that to what he does best, which is you know putting the ball in the air and, and hitting extra base hits for the, for this nationals uh, for this nationals lineup. 
Uh, and I guess, I mean, it's a tiny sample size. In baseball, you always kind of worry too much about putting too much stock into 20 plate appearances. But in the four games that he's played since the home run derby, uh, as of 3.30 p.m. on uh, Tuesday afternoon, mm-hmm. <laughs> so he has played, you know, he's played those four games and has five home runs, uh, two doubles, and he's hitting 588. Uh, so, you know, that's that's a good sign. And I think, you know, more so than just the home runs, it's, it's, the, it's the fact that, We've seen a couple oppo shots, uh, you know, where he just knocks the ball just over the left field, you know, fence. And, and that's always great because, you know, he did it on the home run derby too, where, where that's, he's not a traditional, you know, left-handed power hitter that just is going to pull the ball, you know, to, to right field every time. He, he's an all field hitter and he's really showing that he's, you know, he has the that ability still. And then you also saw a couple of pretty deep shots to right field as well during those, uh, during this recent home run stretch he's on. Uh, which is you take those if you're the Nationals. I don't. I don't think they will cringe at a uh, deep ball to the right field. But he he's been showing them some turnaround. And I think you know if, again if the Nationals are going to make a push, um, which you're looking at a pretty pivotal stretch here with a couple games against the Marlins, then you have the Orioles, then you have the the Phillies. That's uh, a pivotal stretch before the trade deadline. Um, you know you kind of need Juan Soto to be the Juan Soto he was last year and, and has been. Um, for, for much of his young career, um, which is only, he's only 22, but he's been, he's been pretty phenomenal each, each season he's been. And it's not like, you know, this season is, is bad. I mean, his hard hit percentage is, is better than it has been ever. It just, you know, it was, it was more balls in, into the dirt. Uh, he's still getting on base, you know, at a, at a great rate. Um, it just, yeah, if he can lift the ball a little more, um, that'll be a big thing for this, this Washington team uh, as their wait, of course, for Strasburg to come back and as they wait for, mm-hmm. Um, as they wait for Schwarber to come back and and kind of get this get this uh, piece together, but it, it will be a, a pretty big um, couple series here before the July 30 trade deadline. And you know, I think if they were in if the Nationals were in any other division in baseball besides the National League East, they would be sellers. <laughs> like it would be a no brainer. But the fact that you know they're at 44 and 49 as as we're talking and that's six games back in the division. You know, I think Mike Rizzo might look at that and say, oh, maybe there is a chance. You know, he, it'll, it'll be I think a lot of it will kind of dictate, you know, what they do over the next uh, week or so. Yeah, the Marlins, uh, the, the last place team in the division are ten and a half games back. That's the smallest margin between a last place team and a first place team in any division in Major League Baseball. Uh, they are playing the Marlins, followed by the Battle of the Beltways against Baltimore again. And then the Phillies, do you sense uh, or have any I- idea of, of movement if they intend to just stay pat? You're right that it seems like, especially how the beginning of the season started, that, oh, they might start to part with some of these pieces. But it's not, yeah, it's not even necessarily that they need to add anything. It may be just because of how bunched up the division is, and they still have a lot of these games left against division teams, including the Braves, who are also uh, just ahead of them currently, that – this might be almost just a, you know, let's stick to our guns and we, we believe in our guys as opposed to having to add somebody in here to, to give us a, a kickstart. You know, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked to see if they didn't add anybody and, and kind of bank on, okay, maybe a guy comes back from injury here or there, but I, you know, I think, you know, it wouldn't be a, a bad bet to say they, they might add a, you can almost never add too many bullpen arms <laughs> and, and, <laughs> uh, and kind of considering we, we don't really know, you know, all that, much about Starlin Castro at, at this very moment. Uh, he was placed on uh, the, um, I believe it was the um, administrative leave list with after a domestic violence uh, accusation. And, you know, obviously we don't know the exact details on, on his um, time frame yet, uh, on, on what the situation is there. Um, but if, if he is out for a considerable amount of, amount of time, um, you know, I wouldn't be shocked to see the Nationals say, okay, let's get a second baseman or, or let's get a third baseman, somebody that can play in the infield and, and kind of you know, help out this team in, in, in the interim. Um, that will be a consideration. And, and again, you know, I, I don't know the, the details with, with Castro and um, don't really know exactly what, what Mike Rizzo has cooking, but <laughs> you assume that you know, mostly, you know, bullpen arms are, you know, they're always valuable down the stretch if you can get a good one. Um, and, and, you know, they could, they could kind of use another infielder potentially. Um, but again, they, they will get guys back from injury. They, I think they're banking on that a little bit too. Um, and then it's, it's kind of wait and see. I mean, will, will the Nationals trust the, that they went into the season expecting this, this roster to compete for a division title? And I guess, are they going to trust this group to get to a, a level that you, know, you probably need to get 
you know, close to 85 games or so to win this division. And uh, that's a pretty, that's a pretty, uh, they're, they're going to need to make up some ground, of, obviously, over the next 70 some games they play. And as Andy mentioned, that trading deadline uh, across Major League Baseball comes here at the end of this month on July 30th. Let's transition to basketball, where the last remaining NBA team that did not have a head coach now has one in the Washington Wizards. And it's a name and somebody you're going to be familiar with if you're a Wizards fan. Wes Unsell Jr., uh, born in Catonsville, went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, Of course, the son of legendary, arguably the greatest player in the history of the Wizards slash Bullets, Wes Unseld Sr. He started his NBA assistant career here in the district working under his father. He also had stops in Orlando, Golden State, and Denver. 16 years in the NBA as an assistant, uh, most recently, of course, with the Denver Nuggets, where he helped uh, on the defensive side, almost kind of being a de facto defensive coordinator. Uh, for Matt, uh, Matt, for, for Wes, he gets a four year deal for this contract. Uh, he is 49 years old. So it, a lot of opportunity and potential, of course, for him to grow. I, I give the wizards credit on this because I thought maybe I'm stuck a little bit in the kind of the Grunfeld, uh, era of general management for the wizards, where I thought they were going to go established guy. I thought they were going to go stats. I thought they were going to go veteran leadership type of person that's been around the league a long time. And I am happy to see them go with, with Unsell Jr. And just more specifically, not to sound glowing, but it's rare that you can find a guy that ch- checks so many different boxes. It's not just that he's got the connection to the franchise. It's that he paid his dues. It's not taking a guy, a player and just throwing him in there and hoping it works. It's not um, somebody who's inexperienced at fixing a need for Washington, such as defense. So there's a lot as, as somebody who developed Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic and Michael Porter Jr. in Denver. uh, It's, there's a lot of upside potential for the wizards with this, with the roster he has and with the, the way he's paid his dues and what he brings to this franchise and having known this franchise for so many obvious reasons, Matt. Yeah. I I mean, I really like the hire it. It is something a bit new for them, like you said. Like uh, the Wizards haven't had a first-year head coach since Leonard Hamilton. Mm. I believe that was in, in just before Philip Saunders was hired somewhere. Yep. In there. Yeah, the early the early two thousands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, Philip Saunders, excuse me. Um, and, and, and so that hire was actually a disaster. He won nineteen games, only lost the season, and was fired. But the reason I, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic about this hire is you do have to look at Denver's defense. They were a team that were very much like uh, the Wizards a, a few years ago, just kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere. They were on a rebuilding path, had some nice pieces, but you know, you, you look at their roster even now, there's no great individual defender. Like Their best defender was Gary Harris, and they traded him away at the trade deadline, and now their best defender is probably Aaron Gordon. So they don't have a lot of uh, great defenders by any means, but it I think they ranked 11th in defensive rating this past season. They were top 10 unit the year before that. And, you know, we've been saying for five years now under Scott Brooks that the Wizards need to improve their defense, and it really never has. So, you know, I think they're very optimistic uh, about this hire. I think it was kind of interesting uh, in Monday's press conference that Ted Leonsis <laughs> said outright that uh, coaches on their second or third time being a head coach can get lazy and let the assistants do the work that they really like um, Unseld's attention to detail. So maybe that was a shot at, at Scott Brooks, but you know, they are very excited for him. And um, I, I think that, you know, he'll have a big test early, whether he can connect to Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook and keep them in, um, you know, a playoff level type team, but you know, Unseld has his work cut out for him. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. General Manager Tommy Shepard, uh, appearing with the the Sports Junkies on 106.7 The Fan, said that uh, they did 18 different formal interviews uh, and eight over the phone. So a very deep search Washington did. And Shepard said during the introductory press conference for Unselled that they did interview female candidates, uh, did not release any of the the names of who those people were was rumored and we talked about on the previous show uh, that Becky Hammond was uh, who's the San Antonio Spurs assistant was someone who could have been considered for this job but unselled specifically Matt will look to be charged with 
fixing a defense that was 20th uh, in the NBA last year based on his prowess uh, and what he did for Denver. Denver always had some shooting there, but it was about bringing the, the defensive part of the game along, which has kind of helped them elevate and put themselves in this upper echelon of Western Conference teams. And I think with the scoring that you have in Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook on this Wizards team for next year, you're going to look to see if you can bring some of these other players around to both defensively and offensively, but very specifically, if you can raise that team defense level, the Wizards can go from an eight seed maybe into that four or five conversation. But as you mentioned, it's it's kind of a uh, you know work cut out for him situation. Yeah, Bill will be an interesting uh, test case because you look at how his game has expanded offensively. He has so many more responsibilities now that his game has started to lapse on the defensive end. He isn't, I don't think, as good on the defensive end as he was say when the Wizards were a 49 team, a 49 win team when they almost made the Eastern Conference Finals that one year in 2017. You know, he's kind of slipped by then, but it's understandable because of his bigger offensive role. But, you know, for Unseld, he has to get Beal back to that level. He has to make him an average defender. Beal ha- has pretty good size for his position. You know, he he's fast. He can mm-hmm. recover when need to. It's just that it's that constant or consistent discipline. When Ted Leontes was talking to the media, he mentioned that so many players in their exit interviews uh, mentioned the lack of attention to detail that they needed to uh, be more communicate uh, to communicate more on the defensive end. So you know, uh, Anseld he has a pretty good track record in Denver for getting uh, those players to do that, and, and we'll see if he can apply it to the Wizards. I mean, they won 34 games last year, and it, it ha- they've got the talent that could get them into that 40, 45 win range, especially watching this team last year, just some games that they let get away and slip away that, especially in the Eastern Conference, can be the difference between uh, either ending up as the eighth seed or ending up completely out, um, mm-hmm. especially with the play-in tournament coming back in, and then also getting yourself a better, a better matchup and being higher up in the seeding, so... A lot of potential for Washington. Wes Unseld, hoping to continue in his, his father's footsteps, will look to elevate that team and get them back to a state of glory that they've only had since uh, since his father was there, leading uh, the Wizards to four, leading the Bullets then to four uh, NBA Finals and the franchise's lone NBA championship. Let's wrap up with the Washington Capitals, who in the midst of a relatively calm dormant summer, you get one kind of unique quirky fun thing that only comes around once in a while in the national hockey league. And that is an expansion draft comes courtesy of the Seattle Kraken, which will be the NHL's newest franchise playing in Seattle and and giving a a team back to that city after it lost the, uh, the Seattle supersonics to Oklahoma city many years ago, Seattle, led by Hockey Hall of Famer Ron Francis as general manager. I'm going to ask you guys as I read off kind of the names here in the scenarios, each team has to expose, they can protect a certain amount of players, which then leaves certain players exposed. They can protect nine forwards and a goaltender. For the Capitals, and we'll mention Alexander Ovechkin here at the top, who was left exposed, but he is a, a unrestricted free agent, and that's more of a kind of a tactical move by the Capitals that allows them to protect another player because even if the Kraken would pick Ovechkin there, he would not sign there. Um, So we expect a contract from uh, between the Capitals and Ovechkin to finish, which would essentially finish his career here in Washington over the next week or so. But I want you guys to to play Ron Francis for me uh, and, and give me a guy that you would select. We'll talk more about who the Capitals can't afford to lose, Andy, but uh, I'll start with you here in a second. Um, right winger Connor Sherry, 14 goals and eight assists last year, was his first year in Washington after stops in Buffalo and Pittsburgh prior to that. Fan favorite Garnet Hathaway, $1.5 million cap hit, six goals, 12 assists, only 29. So it's uh, that's the guy, if you're Washington, in my opinion, you don't want to lose. G- give or take how this breakdown goes across the, the league, Andy, and, and Seattle uh, selects one player from each team, except for the Los, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights, who are the most recent expansion team. So they get lucky after they, after they did this to everybody else, they don't have to have it happen to them. So that's a nice little perk of it. Garnet Hathaway, of course, would be really great out there. But depending on how Ron Francis fills out this roster, 
which generally lends itself to younger players that teams leave available. Um, a guy like Connor Sherry uh, has such a high ceiling. Whether he can get there uh, is a different story. 14 goals in, in a shortened season last year uh, is significant. If it was a full 82 game season, that's a Connor Sherry is a 20 goal player. But uh, I'd, I'd like you and then I'll go to Matt to select one of these these four capitals um, to be the next member of the Seattle Kraken. I am going to go in a completely different direction. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think Carey Price is going to be the obvious selection in, in net. He's from Montreal. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's probably the, the best netminder out there that's that's available. Um, but you you think you have to look at Vitek Vanacek if you are mm-hmm. if you are the Kraken. Uh, he's young. This was his rookie year, and he did very well in, in a large role for for the Capitals um, in his rookie year. Um, and he's relatively inexpensive, you know, not a huge cap hit. That could be a really intriguing option for them to go if they want an experienced number two that really isn't going to cost that much money, uh, especially because Carey Price is going to, you know, come, come at kind of a premium. Um, but then you also look at, you know, I'll give you two just just because I'm, I'm cheating here and I'm not actually uh, I'm not actually drafting. So I get this luxury, but yes, <laughs> I, I would be, you know, it, it would it would be tough for me to look at you know, seeing Brendan Dillon, uh, the the defender, uh, defenseman, and, and seeing him available, it'd be tough not to look mm-hmm. at him. I know he has a he's a pretty large cap hit. I think it'd be like three point nine million. Um, I don't know if Seattle would, would love that, but he's under team control for a couple more years. Um, he, he's coming off a really good season, um, and he's a left sided defender, which there's not, you know, a huge amount of you know you know left handed uh, skaters out there uh, that that are that are top kind of can be top line defensemen. Uh, maybe maybe he's more of a second line guy. Uh, obviously, with with with, uh, with the Capitals, he was second line uh, defense. But um, those are the two guys I'd really look at. Um, I think there's so many forwards out there that not that there are a dime a dozen, but like you you can find experience in a lot of different ways. But I think finding youth is is often the 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 main thing for if I was creating a team. That's uh, that would be kind of where I'd look with with Vitek, and then. With Dylan, you'd get you'd get a experienced defenseman that uh, you know. I think he's actually from um, Pacific uh, Pacific Northwest. He's uh, I think he's a British Columbia native. So um, yeah, he's from yeah British Columbia. So that that could be that could be kind of interesting as well. Uh, he played. I know he he started his whole thing with uh, I believe he played um, in the Western Hockey League back in the day with the Seattle mm-hmm. Thunderbirds. So, you know, he has experience out there. I, I wouldn't be shocked with, with that pick, but again, this is such a, uh, this is such a uh, throw it up in the air and any, almost anything can happen. So it's, uh, you know, you, you might, you might be spot on and we'll, we'll, you know, you can uh, hold that over my head. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> they are. The, the Vanacek thing is interesting. They're limited to, to three goaltenders. A lot of people do expect Carey Price uh, to go from Montreal where he spent his entire career. Um, kind of like Mark andre Fleury did going from Pittsburgh to Vegas in that expansion draft, and now for Price from Montreal out to, to Seattle. Um, they must select 14 forwards, nine defensemen, and three goaltenders. So uh, it'll be interesting. That, that, that If you want to play the younger game there, that's a good way to to, to shore that up um, as, as Seattle moves forward. They also have to, just one of the fun, other fun quirks, 20 players that are, they have to select 20 players that are under contract. So you can't just, um, you have to take on some of that money basically from other teams. That's kind of the incentive of, well, if I'm going to make this guy, if I'm going to lose a guy, I'm going to make a guy available that maybe if I do lose him, it's not as terrible if I can get some of that money off my book and free up, um, and free up some value for the team that loses the player. Um, Matt, do you have an, uh, in a pick or an indication where, uh, you think Seattle should go and Ron, Fant- Ron Francis should go, uh, in selecting a, a Washington capital for the Kraken? Yeah. You know, to weigh in on Vanacek uh, real quick, um, yesterday or a few days ago, Pierre Lebrun reported that I, I guess the Kraken are kind of honing in on Chris Dredger, the uh, Florida Panthers goalie. He's a free agent, so maybe he'll be their starter. And if that way, you know, you don't spend ten point five million on uh, Carey Price, which is a huge cap hit. Um, so Vanacek, it would be an interesting backup. I, I think his loss would probably hurt the Capitals the most just because you look at Samson off and he was so up and down last year. I don't know if you can rely on him yet as a full-time goaltender. I think they kind of like Vanacek there, but um, if Vanacek stays, then, you know, I, I kind of, we haven't mentioned Nick Jensen, right? He's mm-hmm. 30 years old. He, he's a bit more of an offensive 
Uh, he was in that, that trade last that trade with the Red Wings last year. Yep. Yes, and his cap hit is a little bit more manageable than Brendan Dillon's. It's two point five million each for the next two years. Um, so he'll become a free agent a, a little bit sooner. Um, I, I kind of like Nick Jensen there, if, but I, I think Dylan is a, a smart pick as well, just because he's very physical, can set the tone for Seattle. He, he he's that type of player that, um, you know, I think would help a, a upstart uh, kind of set the tone for their defense. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see whether it's a team that leans on um, experience uh, or wants to just go the. The, the the younger route and we can develop some of these guys because you know when when Vegas did this just four years ago I mean guys like James gave guys like James Neal and Mark Andre Fleury and others um, kind of just a second you know okay hey we're here now let's do it and they've they've run off and become uh, one of the the leading benchmark teams in the Western Conference so it's it's not the it's not the expansion days of old where you've got to claw around for five years uh, building a team the NHL has made this very lucrative for team for the expansion teams but also it's very lucrative for the nhl because the expansion fee is in the 550 million dollar range so it's not cheap to get uh, a team but the nhl seems uh seems content that it's a good uh value hey if we're gonna get a uh, half a billion dollars from somebody for a new team we'll take it and we'll give you some some a player from each of these teams going out i'll mention too as we talk defense here to close out uh, justin schultz a lot of money owed to him, $4 million cap value, but another guy that could help mentor some of these younger defensemen that you'll end up with out there in Seattle. And of course, 32 teams now in the NHL, that will that will take place next year as the league returns to somewhat of its normal realignment. Preseason schedules being announced now and hard to believe that uh, hockey training camp will be around the corner here in just about a month's time, a little over a month's time. That'll do it for this edition of the District of Sports. Matt and Andy, give everybody a sense of what you're working on headed into the crux of the summer here. Matt, I know that we are very close, of course, to the Washington football team opening their training camp and let everyone know where they can find that coverage and your stories. Yeah, you can find it on the Washington Web uh, Times website, washingtontimes.com. Click the sports tab. It'll be all there. You can follow me on Twitter at Matthew underscore Paris. And I'll have a lot of Washington uh, football stuff coming out, but also keep your eye on uh, Olympic stories. We have a couple of those in the chamber Mm -hmm. as well. So very busy here. The Washington (laughs) teams. And, and Andy, um, as, as we get closer to um, the end of the baseball season, we'll have all of that for us. And, Also, the recap on who ends up leaving Washington due to being selected in the draft and Olympic coverage. Andy, where can everybody find that? Yeah, yeah. As as Matt said, uh, check out us. Check us out on the website, uh, WashingtonTimes.com slash sports. Uh, Otherwise, uh, my Twitter has been a little dry recently, but you can uh, you can follow me at AF Kuska, K O S T K A. So feel free to jump on. And a reminder to find the District of Sports podcast wherever you get your podcasts. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and more. Just search District of Sports in your favorite podcast app. And, of course, at Wash Times on Twitter and on Facebook for all of our sports coverage. For Matt, for Andy, I'm George. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.